Greenies, everybody. It's Jesse here, and uh, we're gonna come at you with a little bit of a study. And uh, you know, this uh, this just came upon me, um, and I've been working at this for about a couple of weeks. Well, maybe not a few days, week, a couple of weeks. And I figured I'd bring it to your attention. Um, there was a video I watched regarding, you know, and some people have commented about the uh, first day of the week and communion and these types of things and in regards to the sacraments of like the Eucharist and these types of things like the mass and everything and <clears throat> and making grounds for the establishment of uh, the the Sunday observance and communion and the breaking of bread and so forth so I'm not going to be able to finish this whole study on one video so it's going to take probably maybe two at the most but um, there are some breathtaking things to uh explain here and um I mean, so obviously this is going to go in my research and study playlist and um once these studies are done i'm going to be pulling off some uh archived articles that um things that are being restored and these types of things like for example you got the 500th year anniversary of the of uh the luther's pinning of the 95 thesis that's going to take place in germany um, so there are some very, very significant things coming up uh, within the next couple of years that really we should take note of. But <sighs> so let's go ahead and get started. Now, see what what some are um, really making a mistake on is the aspect of breaking bread and and the first day of the week. So the first video or two are, is going to be dealing with this. And then uh, after this, we're going to deal specifically with the Israel of God and how the Sabbath ties in with the Israel of God, because I think that's just as important. Um, but we're going to concentrate first and foremost on this, because there are some very interesting significances here. And, uh, and so let's go ahead and get started. One of the passages that a lot of people will used to lay claim like regarding the uh, first day of the week observance and these types of things will be Acts chapter 20 and um, so let's go ahead and read that and they usually quote Acts tw chapter 20 verse 7 but they don't really read the rest of it or read any verses above it or below it to get a more of a context of what is being said in that passage so let's go ahead and read from verse 6 and verse 11 and it states and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, and this is going to be a phrase we're going to look at here in this video, when the disciples came together to break bread, we're going to look at that too, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Okay, so this is one of the uh, uh, verses that... Uh, a lot of people will use to uh, give credit to uh, Sunday observance, um, Sunday rest, you know, um, and even Sunday rest is really being promoted like in the recent encyclical Laudato Si, and actually it's being promoted in secular spheres, you know, um, in regards to climate change and these types of things. So, you know, you, 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 you see a lot of the Sunday stuff that's being mentioned all over the place. But let's go ahead and continue. And and, and a lot of uh, um, these churches or these uh, Christians will lay claim that this is a perfect example of first day observance or first day rest, Sunday rest. Because they gather together to break bread. Okay, and hence they, you know, usually assume that with the aspect of communion or the Lord's Supper and these types of things. But we're going to see that that's not the case, because all you got to do is read a little further down. In verse 8 it says, And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread, 
There it is again. That's the same thing as break bread. There's no difference there. And eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. Okay? So, here we have this uh, this phrase, break bread and broke broken bread. Okay, now, if we look elsewhere, we can see what this really is. And they, continuing daily, that is, every day, not not designed as one specific day of the week, okay? And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from where? House to house. This has nothing to do with a cathedral or a church or anything. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added, the tr added to the church daily such as should be saved. So here we have this aspect of breaking bread. This seems to me that it's not really dealing with anything about communion. Okay, the, the, this is this is basically a phrase that was used in that time in the aspect of you know breaking bread, you know supper meal, you know a traditional meal between house to house, you know, um, and these types of things. And it goes right along the line with Acts chapter twenty verse seven and Acts chapter twenty verse eleven. Breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. I mean, this is just this is just a simple concept. I mean, all you gotta do is read the scriptures, and it's right there. You know, just look at the aspects here. Now, in Acts chapter twenty-seven, um, Starting in verse 34 to 37, it states, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. Okay, and you eat food to gain strength. Okay, so again, this is something that was of a daily occurrence. The, the phrase breaking bread has nothing to do with the symbolic meaning of the Lord's Supper. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. And it has nothing to do with what day you go to church. This was something that was being done daily continuing daily with one accord in the temple okay as acts chapter 2 46 says wherefore i pray you to take some meat for this is for your health for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you so again this was for um strength essentially and we had and when he had thus spoken he took bread and gave thanks to god in presence of them all and when he had broken it so there you go and he broke bread took bread and broken it he began to eat again this is you know again this is a analogy of you know I like for example I go to a friend's house you know obviously you know in today's terms say hey if someone you know invites you to have dinner with them they'll say hey you know you want to have dinner with me today or or this evening and you say sure well in this time it would be it would be like hey would you like to come to my house and break bread with me and you would say, sure, it's the same thing. Okay, that that's just a simple concept of it. It's not anything some it's not anything special, okay. I mean scripture is special in the aspect that this that it reveals the truth of this, you know, but we we have to throw aside our our human ordinances and traditions and stop putting our traditions inside of scripture which we really have a we have a very very bad habit of doing okay especially those in the churches and those that are outside the churches as well then were they all of good cheer they were filled they were of good cheer and they also took some meat and we were and all in the ship, two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. Okay, and here's another example. In the feeding of the five thousand, I believe in Matthew fifteen. To the you know the to the disciples. Here's another example. Okay, in Matthew fifteen thirty six to thirty seven, and he, which is Jesus, he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them. Okay, and gave to his disciples. And the disciples to the multitude, and they did what? They did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat 
that was left seven baskets full. Okay, this was essentially a feeding of the five thousand. This was a feeding of the of the starving. Okay, you know, and that's just again, it's just another example of the the phrase having supper. These guys were needing something to eat. Jesus performs this miracle. Okay, he took the seven loaves and the fishes, gave thanks, broke them, and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from this miracle, but I just want to emphasize this. You know, the the simple reality of this. It's nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you want to call it, Eucharist, sac. You know, the sacrament of the Eucharist or whatever it has nothing to do with that. Acts chapter twenty, verse seven has nothing to do with that. Um. And the aspect of the first day of the week, we're going to cover that just now. Um. It has nothing to do with going to a church on a Sunday and having communion. Okay? You know, again, because in Acts chapter 2, 46, it states, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They, they did this daily, breaking bread from house to house. And, oh, and breaking bread from house to house. This was something done in the privacy of people's homes. Then eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Dinner, lunch, supper, whatever you want. Okay? And so, this upon the first day of the week is just simply the aspect of what time they did this specific meal or lunch or whatever. Was it the second day of the week, the first day of the week, the seventh day of the week? No matter. There, there, there's, no, there's nothing to do with sanctifying a day in these verses. It has nothing to do with it. Now, I'm going to, and, and, and we're going to cover the whole aspect of the first day of the week here in just a minute. But again, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had to give, given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Now, this is the aspect of the Lord's Supper. Okay, this is the aspect of the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Okay, and then after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft or often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Key word, for, key, key phrase there, there, as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Was this designed, designated to any? Any one day? Absolutely not. You can take place of this meal, you know, symbolic of um, his confirmation of the new covenant any time. And, it, and it's not to be taken as a literal sacrifice either. That's for the Catholics out there. All right. This was just simply a symbol. It was a memorial, this do in remembrance of me. That's exactly what it was. And it didn't have to be on any specific day of the week. It could be done on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, any day of the week. You can do this. There is no tradition tied to it. That's the problem with these with the tradition of the churches today. And it's just not the Roman Catholics, it's all of them. All right. I mean, like, for example, even like the Seventh-day Adventist church, you look at them, you know, and I was a part of them for a short time, you know. I mean, I do hold the Sabbath day very dearly. I try to, you know, and I do believe that that is a commandment we should be keeping and guarding to this day. But they had some things that were wrong with them. And the aspect of this is the same thing. They, they didn't do communion every Sabbath, but, you know... I went to the church for, I don't know, maybe about four or five months, and, um, you know, they had a schedule of events, you know, and then eventually they, they you know, they had the uh, communion ceremony scheduled, and it's like, this, this is nothing that should be scheduled, this is, you do this as often, any day of the week, it has, you know, you don't need to schedule a time, okay, that's tradition, okay. 
That's tradition. Jesus said, Do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Okay. <sighs> and also, bear in mind this. If you go up a couple of verses earlier in 1 Corinthians 11.20, it states, When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, what do you do there? Let me read that again. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So again, you know, and what's 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 the aspect of a church? You either go on this on the seventh day or you go on the first day. Everyone gets comes gathered together and they all take part in communion or the Eucharist or the or whatever. But here it says when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So again, we have to get rid of our traditions. This is simply that's simply what it is, is traditions. Now, let's look at the aspect of the first day of the week. The first day of the week comes from the uh, Greek phrase Sabbaton, and it's uh, of Hebrew origin, which is the Sabbath, that is Shabbat, or day of weekly repose or rest, from secular avocations. Also the observance or institution itself. By extension, a Senate, Senate that is the interval between two Sabbaths, so from one sabbath to the next from one seventh day to the next seventh day likewise the plural in all the sh above applications sabbath day or actually means a week okay and as i threw in my little note here i said i want to emphasize on this phrase upon the first day of the week you see you you gotta think in the mind of Paul. And Paul, he was a Jew, he was a tribe of Benjamin, and these types of things. So you got to think how they calculated time. All right. And this is how they calculated time. See, it literally translates to first day of the Sabbath. First day of the week. Okay, first day of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is always the seventh day and always will be. Okay, so in which was a day of gathering together. And rest in the Lord, the Sabbath day, the seventh day. The Hebrews, however, they mark the days of the week from from the Sabbath, so from the seventh day. Hence, Sunday was the first of the Sabbath, first day of the week. Monday was the second of the Sabbath, second day of the week, from the Sabbath. That's basically what that means, folks. When you see that phrase, first day of the week... Put it in your mind that that means that the first that is the first day from the Sabbath. That's what that meant. It's it's clear as day. It's simple. All right. It has nothing to do with going to church on Sunday or supporting or people believing that the Bible supports Sunday rest or Sunday observance because it mentions the first day of the week. In places like 1 Corinthians 16.20 and Acts chapter 27, it's, it's just a simple aspect of time, folks. That's all it is. That is all it is. First, first day of the week essentially means basically the day after the Sabbath, which is the first day of the week. Second day of the week is the second day after the Sabbath. That's how the Jews and the Hebrews realize that. It's just as simple. When Paul realized it, just the same. Obviously, he was of Hebraic blood, wasn't he? <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, so I mean... But that's basically the simple aspect of that. And it has nothing to do with distinguishing, you know, rather you go to church on Sunday or go to church on Saturday or any of that rigmarole. Alright? This is... It, it's as simple as the calculation of time and how they did it. Now I want to take you to something very interesting. Now speaking of the Eucharist and the Mass, 
and these types of things. I want to take you to something very interesting. I think you will find this very interesting. <sighs> I uh, highlighted these phrases here and this here because I thought this was very interesting. It says, be healed. Okay. Now, in Revelation 13, it talks about the beast that, you know, the, and he saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, okay? And I still kind of believe, even from 1929, that the beast is still in that healing phase, okay? We're almost to the climax of this whole global government that is basically headed by the beast and its image. Um... And I believe once that healing takes place fully, and it could be a very, very strong possibility that 2017 could be a very major year that that could happen. Um, there could be some very interesting things. Now this, now this word here, be healed and restore, you can find it in Daniel 12:11. Now I know, and. I myself am not too sure sure of this yet, but I do have to stick with scripture here. Over and over and over again, like in Revelation Daniel, it talks about 1,260 days, day for a year, 1,260 years, and these types of things. All right? And I understand that, and I and I believe that's totally fa factual, scriptural evidence of that. Time, times, and half a time, and these types of things all refer to the same period. 42 months, 1,260 years of papal supremacy. When they wore out the saints of the Most High and other other most bloody persecutions and martyrdom and these types of things, but at the same time, you have to ask yourself this question: Is you know, because after the deadly wound, you know, which happened in 1798, obviously, uh, some people will believe that we have entered into what is called the time of the end. Okay. And um, and Daniel 12 actually represents an aspect that says that the time of the end. Um, let me go ahead and see if I can pull it up. Okay, yeah. And in Daniel 12, 9, it says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Okay. Now, if the deadly wound was, he if, if the deadly wound was inflicted in 1798, that could have been we have come to the time of the end. All right. Now, let's go ahead and read these verses now. In Daniel 12:10, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. See, I personally believe that I think that this time of the end was that cutoff point, that deadly wound being healed after 1260 years. All right. <clears throat> And I'm also of the belief that not every time prophecy, not every single time prophecy should be taken as a day for a year. Okay? I don't think it's not every single one. Clear evidence of day for a year, you can find that in the 1,260 years, has an exact fulfillment. Um, another aspect of this is uh, the 70 weeks prophecy, which has a complete fulfillment during the time of Christ. Okay, so Daniel 12 and 11 and Daniel 9 27 are two different times. Okay, and I'll point that out here in a minute. Daniel 12 11 says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Some people say that the sacrifice word is in italics, so it's not in the original. That's fine. So you can say, and from the time the daily shall be taken away, or you can just read the whole thing. Which says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, not a thousand two hundred and sixty days, okay? A thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, there'll be some historicists that will like will tack on thirty years prior to the start of the one thousand two hundred sixty years, okay? And they'll put that bam right in that same time slot you know and it says blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days or one thousand three hundred and thirty five days and again 
what they'll do is they'll take 45 years and tack it on behind the 1,290 days or 45 or yeah so it'll be literally 1,335 day time slot that starts then the 1,290 and then a 1,260 so they put all of that back there but we have to understand and again I am of the utmost belief that Revelation when it talks about those 1,260 days and these types of, I think that's all referring to that same time period of papal persecution but what if actually Revelation does, and Revelation does not mention anything about 1,290 days? Nothing. Nor does it mention anything about 1,335 days, which I think com are combined of the two. Okay. Now, simply, if you take, uh, you know, 1,335 days. You know, you add about three, I mean, it's about three and a half to almost four years. You know, could that be the final three and a half to four year mark of this age until the second coming of Christ? It could very well possibly be. And there is a very interesting thing about this. Now, we know that the Catholic Church is enshrined in idolatry. Okay, and I want to go back to Daniel twelve eleven. Okay, and Daniel twelve eleven says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice, I'll go back to my notes here, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, see, the thing is, the, the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican, the papacy, they're already an abomination. Okay. But what if we were to take this phrase here, the abomination that maketh desolate set up to mean be healed or restored. And then you look at Revelation chapter 13 and you look at the aspect of the, the, um, the mortal wound being healed. There should be 1,290 days. It is a very strong possibility it could play out that way. Now, what is this daily sacrifice? Because this daily sacrifice is certainly not the same thing as this in Daniel 9. Reason being is the wording is totally different. And this is talking about a totally different period of time from Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, 27, it states... Go back to Daniel 9, 27... And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblations to cease. And that is Jesus Christ that does that, because he was the perfect sacrifice. And then again, when you look at um, the memorial of the, uh, uh, of the Last Supper, back up here, you read that after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drank it in remembrance of me. In remembrance that he is the one that caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Simply as a memorial, as a symbol of that. Now, what happens, and we can see this clearly happening every day, especially in this day and age. That just to simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way, the truth, and the life, and these types of things, as it's basically being called radical fundamentalism, and it's being slowly rooted, rooted out. See, the world has to basically level Jesus down to a plane as every single other religion on the planet. And that's why you have all this call of religious unity that the Pope is doing and these types of things. Is he is they have to bring Jesus Christ down. He cannot be elevated above any other religion. He has to be on the same level plane. And if you believe contrary to that, then you're in trouble. Okay, it's just as simple as that. Alright, now we just realized that this Last Supper thing has nothing to do with tradition of when you do communion. It is to be done as often as you do it in remembrance of him. 
any day of the week is fine. It has no meaning on what day you do it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay? And and this, remember, it takes you back to Daniel 9.27. This is not talking about Daniel 12.11. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice of the oblations to cease. That was Jesus Christ that did that. That is not the Antichrist. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. This abomination of desolation is the false sacrifices that continued after Jesus said it was finished. After the perfect sacrifice. This was the overspite of abominations. Because Jesus said, Your house is left unto you desolate, speaking of the temple. He shall make it desolate even till the consummation. And even if you take the word consummation, I'll do it real quick here. It literally means essentially a completion altogether consumed. Consummation was determined. Make a full, utter end or riddance. And Jesus said, Not one stone will be left unto you upon another that will not be thrown down. This happened in 70 AD. That's what, that's, that's what this is talking about. And that's what the prince that shall come in the above verse that shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, which was Prince Titus, son of the Emperor Vespasian, in his 10th legion, that's what they did. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Who was that that was determined? It was the Jewish people. After basically 70 AD, they were scattered. So therefore, there is no more need for a physical temple on this earth. You have one opportunity, one opportunity alone. And that's this life right here to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and king okay you need to do it now you cannot wait regardless of Jew or Gentile now we're on the aspect of sacrifice since Jesus was the final sacrifice and he gave that sacrifice as some as a symbolic meaning in the Lord in the Lord's Supper which he basically states do this as often as you would in remembrance of me now what would happen because in the Mass, because obviously we know that Jesus was crucified, and then he died, was buried, and was resurrected. So he's no longer on a cross anymore, right? Well, what do you have to have when you have a sacrifice? You have to have an altar. I'm not talking about a pulpit. I'm talking about an altar. All right? Now, on the altar, you have this nice little setup here. And you have a crucifix, not cross. You have a crucifix behind you with Jesus Christ still on that cross. And Rome teaches that that is a, a perpetual sacrifice. And that sacrifice is found in what they believe in transubstantiation by transferring the body and blood, the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ into the bread and wine of the host that's what that is okay and the Protestants they do a watered down version of it in their churches on Sundays and even on Saturdays alright so with that said and we know that the church has practiced the mass for over a thousand years now but Let's just look at this phrase in Daniel 12:11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. So, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Could that be that the aspect of the symbolic aspect of the of the last supper and also the aspect that Jesus is the only way to the Father by means of accepting him for what he did on that cross as that daily being taken away that daily sacrifice being taken away and what is being put in place there the abomination that maketh desolate set up or be healed because the one that was offering the sacraments of the mass received the deadly wound now did he and that wound is being healed now what happens if that wound is being healed and they make it into a law that 
the one true sacrifice is to be made is not to be taken above the church or any other religion. Something to consider now, wouldn't it? That's why I think you cannot just look at this passage in Daniel 12 11 and uh, Daniel 12 12 and just simply to say, oh, that's 1,290 years. Oh, that's the same as 1,260 days or 1,260 days. You know, you just can't really say that because there are some very interesting significances here that I think we should take note of. That word set up actually can be translated as be as be healed. Okay, and restore. And this is totally different than what we read in Daniel 9.27. On Daniel 9.24 through 27. So even though Revelation does not make mention of 1,290 days or 1,335 days, Could Daniel 12.11 actually be hinting at a portion of time that will be the final three and a half years on this planet? You ain't going to find it in Revelation. It's not there. All those times of 1,260 days and these type of things all come to the same conclusion of the uh, ruling power, the, the ruling time prior to that deadly wound. But this right here is something a little different, and I think we have to look at it as a little different because it's certainly different in wording. And I don't think that's something we can just attribute to throw in the past and just say, well, all these other denominations believe it was so, so it has to be right. No, 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 no. No. We have to look at the Bible and see what it says. Okay? And this could very well be the final three and a half years or three and a half years plus add another 75 days to it so anyways you know because again when you look at Daniel 10 you come across something very interesting Daniel 12 10 I mean and again Daniel 12 10 states Many shall be, or Daniel 9, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Okay? And I believe that time of the end, that ceiling broke open at the close of 1798 and the process of that deadly wound from 1798 to roughly around 1814. And then finally, when they just completely lost all the papal states in 1870, but the initial deadly wound was in 1798. And that basically ended, that ended this time of the end of 1,260 years. And from that period, or I said that backwards, and from the close of the, of the 1,260 years, that's when the time of the end is upon us. Okay? For the words are closed up and sealed. Well, after this 1,260 years, it seems like there is a huge, huge awakening of these prophecies. And so I would have to safely assume that, well, maybe certain things are starting to become unsealed. And it sure seems like that this period here happens after the deadly wound. 1,290 days and bless he that cometh through the 1,335 days. So again, is there going to be something that's going to happen in this world that will become obvious to those true believers that will signify a final 1,290 days? Or I should really say a final 1,335 days of of this age essentially I think it's a strong possibility you know and I'm just bringing up this possibility I'm not saying for sure but I just don't think we can just automatically assume that we can put these two prophecies you know these two dates these two dates 
into the realm of history. Okay. This isn't futurism or anything like that. But what I am simply saying is, you know, when when this abomination that make it desolate is set up or again healed or restore or being restored or being healed, it'd be a thousand two hundred and ninety days healed, deadly wound being healed, and after the full healing of that, well, there's going to be something that's going to happen. Maybe from that time point, we might be able to figure out that maybe this 1,290 days could possibly be one of the only time prophecies that can equal up to just three and a half years that is to be put into the future. Three and a half years plus, okay? Because again, you know, and I'm going to repeat this again. You do not see this anywhere in Revelation. Nowhere. You do not see nowhere 1,335 days in Revelation. But you do see it here. Again, you see 1,260 days all over in Revelation and in Daniel. But this one, you just see in Daniel. Nowhere else. So, I hope that uh, raises some questions, and I hope this has been a little informative for you. And in the next video, we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 16, too. And uh, so you've got a lot to get to, so next video will be a lot shorter, I think. But And then we're going to get into the aspect of the, the Sabbath and why um, why it should be guarded and kept. Um, and these types of things because there are some very interesting significances in that commandment alone but that will probably be the third video in this next video we're going to be looking at uh, this aspect of I mean we covered the phrase upon the first day of the week but now we're going to look at lay by him in store we're going to see what that means we're going to dissect this verse a little bit and uh, and at the conclusion of this you're going to come to realize that uh, this is not talking about putting money in a collection plate on a Sunday. Okay. So, again, I hope you found this little study interesting and fascinating. Um, until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.